Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Pretoria today. I'm attending a conference hosted by the Afro-Middle East Center. It's a research institute based in Johannesburg that focuses on Middle East issues. And today they're having a conference that's examining the uh, uprisings in the Middle East and their implications and meaning for democracy and what impact that will have on Africa per se. The event is being attended by a host of very prominent South African and international speakers and attendees. And I have the privilege of speaking to, on the sidelines of the event, Juan Cole. Um, Juan is a prominent uh, American scholar who specializes on Middle East issues. Welcome to Saxis, Juan. Thank you very much. As this conference is taking place, there's also a, a very significant event taking place in Iran. The Non-Aligned Movement Summit is taking place in Tehran. It's the first time that the summit has uh, been hosted in that country. It's one of few major international meetings that takes place in Iran. And what's quite unique about this meeting is that it, it's being attended by 120 countries, 50 heads of state are going to attend this meeting and at the same time Washington and Israel are trying to isolate Iran and Israel for its part is trying to ramp up war talk this year. Tell us uh, one, um, what do you make of the situation as it's playing itself out at the moment with all these countries really just uh, rejecting Washington's isolation of Iran? Yeah, the United States is attempting to make Iran a pariah in world affairs. Uh, the issues that drive this American policy mainly have to do with Iran's rejectionist stance towards Israel and its insistence on developing its nuclear enrichment program, which the United States, uh, the Israelis, and much of Europe uh, view as likely an attempt ultimately to develop the ability to make nuclear warheads. So um, the U.S., uh, uh, for both of these reasons, is imposing very wide-ranging uh, economic sanctions, financial boycotts, uh, and even uh, more recently a financial blockade on Iranian petroleum. Uh, and the way they're proceeding is by threatening third parties, India, South Korea, and so forth, with various forms of American sanctions were they not to reduce their imports of Iranian petroleum. What does it mean that all these countries are attending this meeting? Well, obviously it, it is a response by the Global South, I think, to uh, this concerted campaign of the U.S. Uh, uh, government. Uh, it's a, a symbolic action saying we, we're not aboard with making Iran a pariah. We're, we're not willing to buy into that project of isolating Iran. Uh, India, for instance, sees Iran as a business opportunity and uh, uh, their delegation includes 200 businessmen who hope to make deals. Uh, the U.S. has been making it impossible for countries to transfer funds to Iran. It, it has been isolating Iran from the international banking system. And so, uh, India has uh, agreed now to use various forms of barter and Iran uh, is beginning to accept Indian rupees, a soft currency for payment. Uh, so um, uh, there, it's a sign of resistance to uh, the attempt to isolate Iran. What do you think this meeting is going to achieve? Well, these non-aligned movement meetings are not known for their action items. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of symbolic politics uh, played out. I think they, the, the movement's origins had to do with uh, uh, the reluctance of uh, Egypt and India and Indonesia in their time in the 1950s to be conscripted into one side or the other uh, in the great Cold mm -hmm. War struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. uh, in a way, the end of the Cold War brought up the question of whether the non-aligned movement really has a purpose any longer. Uh, and uh, as it goes forward, I think it increasingly is trying to be a, a voice for those countries that are not part of the G20, you know, they're not part of the economic elite of the world. Now at the same time, um, there is talk about war. 
and that's really being promoted by Israel this year. Can you tell me, what are your predictions? Do you think that there will be a military strike against Iran? My own uh, analysis of it is that uh, the uh, right-wing, uh, far-right-wing Israeli government uh, of the Likud party, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, is bluffing. Uh, I think that uh, he is attempting to pressure the United States uh, to strike at Iran's nuclear facilities. Uh, and one of the ways that he can pressure them is to threaten to do it himself if the U.S. won't. Uh, I don't believe that there will be any dramatic policy change in the United States of that sort during a presidential election year. Uh, you know, if you start a big international project 80 days before a national election, you don't know whether it will seem to fail or succeed, and it would be uh, foolish uh, to uh, initiate such a project at this time politically in the United States. So uh, I don't think uh, Iran is going to be on the front burner uh, until at least uh, next year. And if, the Ob if Obama wins the presidential election, uh, even then, I, I think it's much more likely that uh, the U.S. will continue with these deep sanctions uh, than that there will be a military action. So I, I, my own analysis is that Mr. Netanyahu is doomed to be disappointed. You said if uh, President Obama wins this election, um, having you here is an opportunity for me to uh, ask you, for our South African audience, what you think about the outcome of the upcoming presidential election uh, in America? Which way do you think it's going to go? <laughs> At the moment, uh, President Obama has many advantages uh, mm -hmm. in the election. Uh, incumbents have an advantage, and uh, it's, it's a little bit rare for an incumbent to lose. Uh, and then the, um, the United States uh, presidential elections are not conducted on the basis of a popular vote. Uh, there is an electoral college, so each of the states elects delegates to the electoral college, who in turn then elect the president indirectly. And in that electoral college, uh, Obama has a very substantial lead in likely delegates at, as we speak. So it's a very uphill battle for Mr. Romney to overcome that lead. Uh, again, uh, the United States is a very evenly divided society between its two major parties. Uh, it's almost 50-50. And uh, many states consistently vote for one or the other. And so the election is really happening only in 12 states. Those are the swing states that might go Democrat or might go Republican. And of course, within each of the 12 states, about a third of the people are diehard Democrats and a third are diehard die uh, Republicans. So the election will be decided by the independent voters, the middle 30 percent, and perhaps the middle 10 percent in each of the 12 states. So it's, it's a very narrow contest in some ways and the, um, the, advertising, the advertising and the commercials for the campaigns are being heavily concentrated on those states that might change their minds. Uh, and again, at the moment, we have recent polling that Obama is very substantially ahead in Pennsylvania. Uh, many of the uh, swing states uh, uh, give Obama a, a statistical lead of some significance. So um, uh, I'd have to say that uh, if you were a betting person, at mm. the moment, the good money would be on Obama. So are the American people particularly, particularly swayed by, the, by either party's foreign policy positions? I'm afraid to say that foreign policy is almost completely irrelevant in this election. Uh, it's barely brought up. Uh, even though the United States still has tens of thousands of troops in Afghanistan, I don't believe either candidate has much mentioned Afghanistan. Uh, Obama has set two years from now, 2014, as a withdrawal date. And the only criticism Mr. Romney has of that move is to say, well, he shouldn't have announced it. It's all right that there should be a two-year deadline for withdrawal, uh, but he shouldn't have said so. Um, and so the, the foreign policy uh, issues don't it enter very much into the debate. I, uh, American presidential debates tend to be very much focused on domestic issues. And occasionally you will have a period, as in the Vietnam War or the Iraq War, when uh, a foreign war will, uh, will impinge on the 
election. But in this case, it doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, it's all about jobs and mm -hmm. um, health care mm -hmm. and uh, women's rights and uh, reproductive rights. And uh, those are the hot button issues. And just taking you back a little bit to the discussion we were having about Iran, should we have a Mitt Romney uh, victory and he becomes president, uh, what stance do you think he would take on Iran? Well, Romney is a hawk on I Iran and uh, he may or may not stick to his current position, but his current position is that the U.S. should be willing to take military action to halt Iran's nuclear enrichment activities. Uh, so the likelihood of an, a U.S.-Iran military confrontation uh, is elevated for Romney to win. Juan Cole, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for joining us at the South African Civil Society Information Service.